So let's continue understanding chemicals and the health hazards associated with them in this short video lecture series. So what makes a chemical concentration toxic? We've already talked about um, exposure routes as well as doses and frequency of exposure. But now let's look at what scientists do to determine whether or not a chemical concentration is considered toxic. So scientists use three methods to determine the level at which a substance poses a health threat. They use case reports by physicians, and these case reports from doctors can be used to study people that have experienced adverse effects as a result of some kind of accident or deliberate poisoning or other event. It's difficult to determine the exact dosage of the chemical received by the person or the overall health of the person pre the exposure. So the case reports are helpful but cannot solely be relied upon. Then we have laboratory investigations. Lab tests on mice and rats and bacteria are used to determine acute short-term and chronic long-term toxicity. Controlled experiments in which the effects of the chemical on a test group are compared to the response of a control group. The age, the health status, and the genetic makeup of the test animal is known. These lab tests can take two to five years just to test one chemical and can cost up to two million dollars. Thousands of rats and mice are tested throughout this time frame for just one particular chemical test. Lab investigations seem to be the most reliable, however some scientists challenge the validity of extrapolating the data from the test animals to humans because human physiology and metabolism is different from that of the test animals. The third method is epidemiological studies of humans that have been exposed to some type of chemical. Basically, these epidemiological studies compares the health of people that are exposed to a particular chemical with a control group of people that were not exposed. Epidemiology is the study of the pattern of disease or toxicity to find out why some people get sick and others don't. The health of the people exposed to a particularly toxic agent i.e. maybe the experimental group, is compared to the health of another group of people that were not exposed. Many toxic agents um, ha um, have not been exposed to people and hence it's tough to come to statistically sound conclusions from these epidemiological studies. So really what we need to rely on the most is these lab tests. Now. All methods for estima estimating these toxicity levels and risks do have limitations, but they're all that we have. So when we need to set the standard allowable concentration for safe drinking water for a chemical, we look back to these tests or these methods. So standards for allowed exposure to toxic substances are typically set at 100 to 1,000 times lower than the established harmful concentration. So let's say the LD50 value for DDT is 100 parts per million. Well, we know that DDT is a potential carcinogen and um, mutagen and can cause birth defects. So we are going to establish that the um, permissible maximum contaminant level of DDT in groundwater would be 1,000 times lower than 100 or 0.1 part per million. So that's how they utilize this information to develop safe drinking water standards and safe water quality standards for streams, as well as Clean Air Act standards as well. So we've talked about the potential for chemicals being released into the air, the land, or into the water from industrial processes, manufacturing processes, as well as agricultural use of chemicals. But we haven't yet talked about the potentially harmful chemicals that can be found in our own individual homes. The average American home contains 100 pounds of household hazardous waste, also called HHW. The diagram on the screen in front of you depicts the different ways in which household hazardous waste could be potentially present in your home, as well as just various chemicals. So HHW could come in the form of motor oil or pesticides that you may use for the trees or the grass or your flower beds or even your vegetable garden herbicides, different types of paints or different types of stains, and the list goes on. Gasoline is also on this list as well, and various cleaning agents are considered to have uh, chemicals in them that can be potentially hazardous for human health. 
these materials in your home, if it's actually falling under the category of household hazardous waste, are supposed to be disposed of in a safe manner. We'll talk about household hazardous waste disposal when we get to the waste section of this course. So some chemicals can cause cancers, mutations, and birth defects, and we're going to talk about these different categories. Mutagens are chemicals that cause increased genetic mutations, which result in changes in the DNA and alterations of chromosomes, or the absence of a chromosome, or the addition of an extra chromosome. Basically, mutagens are chemicals that cause random mutations in genetic information of a living cell that can be transmitted to the offspring and reproduced in future generations. Examples of this um, are manic depression, cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, sickle cell anemia, Down syndrome, as well as some types of cancer. So it's not a lethal issue. Non-lethal changes in reproductive cells can be passed on to one's children. Now, carcinogens are chemicals or virus or radiation that can cause or promote the growth of malignant cancerous cells in which certain cells multiply uncontrollably. About 10 to 40 years may elapse between the initial exposure to a carcinogen and the appearance of actual detectable health symptoms. Carcinogens usually require repeated exposure for many years in order to stimulate tumor production or the malignant cells. Examples of carcinogens from a chemical standpoint are arsenic and benzene, formaldehyde, PCBs, certain chemicals in tobacco, smoke, and uh, vinyl chloride, and the list goes on from there. Teratogens are chemicals that um, can cause birth defects while the human embryo is growing and developing during pregnancy. Some examples of teratogens are PCBs, or steroid hormones and heavy metals such as arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. So we've been talking about chemicals and human health effects resulting from chemical exposures, and I just defined in the previous slide the term carcinogen. Well, studies of chemicals have indicated that only a relatively small number of thousands of chemicals in commercial use actually cause cancer. Currently, the American Cancer Society estimates that one in three people will develop cancer in some form during their lifetime. Yet only an estimated 5 to 15 percent of these people's cancer development stem from occupational exposures to chemicals. So looking at this chart from the American Association for Cancer Research, dated 2012, it depicts the predominant causes of cancer. The greatest cause of cancer is tobacco use at 33 percent, followed by excess, excessive weight and obesity at 20 percent, and then there's an unknown category at 11%. But then we have a group of items that fall in the 5% category, including diet, lack of exercise, occupation, viruses, family history. So most of the causes of cancer fall into categories that are personal choice categories, tobacco use, excessive weight, diet, lack of exercise some things you can't control such as occupational exposures and virus exposure as well as genetic family history but even the alcohol consumption at three percent contributing to cancer is a personal choice there's also been documented studies that some chemicals can affect human systems including the immune system the nervous system and the endocrine system Pesticides have been documented to impact the immune systems. Neurotoxins and chlorinated hydrocarbons like DDT, PCBs, and dioxins, as well as some heavy metals, have been known to attack the nervous system. Most recently, an area of research and study is the impact of chemicals on the endocrine system and our hormonal system. Basically, this system regulates the control and growth and sexual reproduction, learning ability, and behavior for people. What ends up happening is that some pesticides and synthetic chemicals called hormone activation agents have very similar shapes to our natural hormones, and they can replace those hormones. They're known as hormone mimics or hormone blockers, and it then disrupts our endocrine system and causes health problems. So, 
As far as all of this is concerned, what can you do to limit your exposure to chemicals or even to just hormone disruptors? Well, when you're shopping at the grocery store, look for certified organic produce and meats so you're not taking any chance of consuming produce that may have pesticide residue on it. Avoid processed and prepackaged and canned foods. Uh, these foods have multiple food additives in them that haven't, that haven't been thoroughly tested under the current food and drug um, regulations. Use glass and ceramic cookware instead of plastic because plastic does have constituents in it like vinyl chloride that has been linked to various health effects. Store your food and your drinks in glass containers. Again, stay away from the use of plastic. Use natural cleaning and personal care products instead of chemically related personal care products like hair dyes. Use natural fabric shower curtains, not vinyl, because those give off vinyl chloride in a gaseous form. Avoid artificial air fresheners and fabric softeners and dryer sheets. And if you have a child, only use glass baby bottles and BPA-free and phthalate-free sippy cups, pacifiers, and toys. All of these steps will help reduce your risk of exposure to various types of chemicals that can have health effects. So this begs the question, I've mentioned the, that there's over 80,000 chemicals used commercially and only about 18,000 pesticides are currently regulated by the EPA. So why do we know so little about the harmful effects of chemicals? Three major reasons for this information are as follows. One, under the existing laws, most chemicals are considered innocent until proven guilty. About 99% of the commercially used chemicals in the U.S. are not regulated by federal, state, and state governments. Also, number two, there are not enough funds, personnel, and facilities, and test animals to provide such information for more than a small fraction of the many chemicals that we encounter in our daily lives. Three, we know little about the chemical interactions with other technologies and other chemicals or the effects of such interactions on human health and ex ecosystems. So we might test one chemical and know what its health effect is, but we're not sure if two chemicals are in the same groundwater system, what their interaction is, and what the subsequent potential health effect is, is if we drink that water that's contaminated with both of those chemicals. So it's tough to study even just three chemical interactions among the top 500 most widely used industrial chemicals. It would require more than 20 million experiments, which is just a physical and financial impossibility. Scientists recognize this difficulty of testing all chemicals. As a result, the precautionary principle applies where the viewpoint is that um, because we don't know all the harmful effects of chemicals, it's important that health officials and government agencies push for a greater emphasis on pollution prevention and source reduction, and that we follow alternative approaches to pesticide application in our agricultural sector, and we use pollution prevention approaches to minimize the use of chemicals in our industry and manufacturing sectors. So to wrap this whole thing up, talking about chemicals and their ecological impact and human health impact, the precautionary principle is something discussed in your book. It's basically an advocate that when there is a reasonable but incomplete scientific evidence of significant or irreversible harm to humans or the environment from a proposed or existing chemical or technology, we should take action to prevent or reduce that risk instead of waiting for more conclusive, reliable scientific evidence. So in other words, take action now to reduce suspected consequences rather than wait for scientific results to show the conclusive effects. There's definitely controversy over the extent of the implementation of this principle. Those in favor basically say to introduce a new chemical, a company must cover the cost of testing to determine the safety before it's used. And those in favor also say remove harmful chemicals from the market and don't allow them to be used anymore. The people that are against the precautionary principle basically say this is impossible to monitor. Only 200 of the more than 85,000 chemicals registered have been fully testing. And testing the rem remaining amount of chemicals would be completely cost prohibitive. I challenge you to form your own opinion about the precautionary principle. Please recognize that countries around the world are focusing more on pollution prevention to minimize chemicals in the environment.